take a Bible this morning and uh, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 21. If you have one of our Bibles, that's page 273. We will look at uh, 2 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 14 this morning. Once more, I invite you to stand to honor the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the face of the Lord, and the Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. And David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, What do you say that I shall do for you? They said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be given to us so that we may hang them before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Meholathite. And he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord. And the seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until rain fell upon them from the heavens, and she did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day or the beasts of the field by night. When David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the men of Jabesh-Gilead who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hanged them, on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. And he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who were hanged, and they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin in Zelah, in the tomb of Kish his father. And they did all that the king commanded. And after that, God responded to the plea for the land. Let us pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for the gift of your word. And ask that your spirit may bless the hearing of it. May we know that as you come to us through your word, we are in the presence of holiness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, perhaps you read the text in anticipation of today, or perhaps not, and you just read it now. But either way, I'm willing to guess that, at least for some of us, this is a difficult text. It probably left you with some questions, left you puzzling, perhaps even offended. This is the kind of text that rubs us the wrong way. It's, it's like the command given to Israel to annihilate the Canaanites, everything that breathed, men, women, and children. Or like the text where Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark and the Lord strikes him down on the spot. Or perhaps when the Lord sent fire to consume Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. These kinds of passages in the Bible 
have a tendency to rub us the wrong way, but we do not need to shy away from them. Difficult passages can actually be great blessings because so often they can expose underlying assumptions that we have that are simply not true. And they can push against those assumptions and in some cases even cause us to have a paradigm shift in the way that we think and enhance our understanding of who God is. So I encourage you today, do not shy away from this difficult text, but come to it, come to it ready to learn and to submit to all that it tells us about God. You cannot understand the Bible until you first stand under the Bible. And that's what I want us to do today. We've come now to the last section of the books of First and Second Samuel, chapters 21 to 24. And here we've concluded the narrative that the author's been telling us about David's kingdom and the threat to David's kingdom and God's preservation of David's kingdom. And now we come to chapters that are not in chronological order. They're not carrying that same story forward. They're just giving us different snapshots of the period of David's reign, different snapshots that occurred during that time to show us that God remained faithful to the house of David in keeping his covenant promise to David. And uh, in, ver in chapters 21 to 24, there's clearly a chiasm at work. Now, I don't like to point out chiasms everywhere because sometimes they're just made up. But this one's a very clear one. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. And I don't want you to write this down uh, because that would take you too long and it's too much information. If you want to see this, you want to get a copy of this, it'll be on the website if you look at the sermon manuscript. Or you could email me, I'll give it to you. But what you can see from this outline of these four chapters is that the A sections, the story we're looking at today, and, and then the end of the book of 2 Samuel shows us uh, that God it was in some way turned uh, from his wrath against Israel because of some action that David took. So atonement was made in uh, the A sections. In the B sections, you have David's mighty men. And in the C sections, you see David's song of deliverance and then David's final words. Both of these are poetic sections uh, that, that come at the heart of this chiasm. But you can see from the parallels today that we're dealing with a story that has to do with atonement. And this will be a recurring theme in the last four chapters of 2 Samuel. Atonement is at the heart of the Bible. It is the very purpose for which God the Son became a man. That he might make atonement for sin. And because it is such an important subject at the heart of the Bible story, we must think carefully about what the Bible tells us atonement is. We need to think in the Bible's own categories. Let the Bible instruct us. If we simply create our own categories, follow human wisdom in uh, seeking to understand atonement for sin, we will go astray. But if we follow closely what Scripture teaches, uh, we will see this glorious truth revealed today in a very difficult text. There is a continental divide in theology. The continental divide is the, the place on the continent where all the water flows in one direction or another. And so when you cross that, all of a sudden you're in a different setting where all the water that, that, that falls from the sky is now flowing in a different direction. Well, in theology, there's something similar. Theology shows a continental divide between those who begin with a God-centered vision of reality and those who begin with a man-centered vision. We will either put God at the center where he is supreme and where the honor and glory of his name is what matters the most, or we will put ourselves at the center. And that divide affects the way you understand atonement. Those who begin with man will not be able to make sense of the Bible's teaching about atonement for sin. And this text, consequently, will be offensive and make no sense at all. But I would argue if we let it push against our native assumptions toward a more God-centered vision of reality, we will see the glory of the atonement 
testified to in this passage of Scripture. And so as we walk through the story today, I want to draw out three truths about the biblical teaching on atonement. First, atonement is necessary because God is holy. Atonement is necessary because God is holy. The text begins by telling us there was a famine in the land of Israel during David's reign that lasted for three consecutive years. Now, one year of lighter than average rainfall, low crop yields, was not terribly uncommon. Two years in a row would start to draw some attention. Three years in a row, David knows something is wrong. And he knows that this is from the Lord. And so David, it tells us in verse 1, sought the face of the Lord, probably by inquiring of a prophet. Why is this famine happening? And according to uh, the rest of verse 1, the Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. The Lord graciously revealed the cause of the famine so that David could address it. Now, in order to understand this cause of what Saul had done and why it was such a big deal, we have to understand the background of the story of the Gibeonites. So let's go back to the time of Joshua. Joshua's leading Israel into the land, and you may recall the Lord had given a command to Israel that they were to annihilate the Canaanites completely. Everything that breathed among the Canaanite peoples, the, the groups of all the various nations that lived in the promised land, they were to be killed and the land completely cleansed that it may become a dwelling place for the Lord. And Joshua began that campaign and the peoples of the land started to respond in various ways. Many of them would, would come out and attack Israel. But one people, the Gibeonites, who did indeed dwell in the land, realized our turn is coming. And so they came up with a plan. Uh, as Greg read earlier in the service, they presented themselves to the Israelites as though they had come from a long journey. They wore worn out clothes and they brought uh, crumbly bread and burst wineskins and they pretended that they did not live in the land. And of course, Israel was under no obligation to kill those who were not in the land. They could freely enter into covenants with them. And so the Gibeonites very shrewdly presented themselves as though they were not dwellers of the land. And they came and presented to Israel terms of a covenant, a treaty whereby they could become allies. And very foolishly, the leaders of Israel did not seek the Lord. But they believed their own eyes and they entered into a covenant to swear loyalty to the Gibeonites. According to Joshua 9.15, it says, And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. And so in a sinful act where they had not sought the, the direction of the Lord, Israel entered into covenant. But once it had been done, the Lord's name was now attached to it. They had invoked the name of the Lord in a covenant they made with this people, presumably by cutting animal carcasses in two and laying them out beside each other so they could walk through the pieces together and call down upon themselves the, the curse of the covenant to say, may the same happen to us if we break this covenant. May the Lord destroy us if we are unfaithful to this covenant. So the Lord's name has been invoked. His wrath and curse have been called down in the event that this covenant is ever broken. So now let's ask the question, what would it say if this covenant were in fact broken and the Lord did nothing? What would it say about his own name? It would say his name can be trifled with. That his name can be taken in vain. That he is not, in fact, the holy God of Israel. And so you can see that generations later, when King Saul comes along and breaks this covenant, Israel has a problem. Now, we don't actually have it recorded for us where in the story of Saul this happened, what he actually did specifically. We only have it reported that it had happened, and that's in verse uh, 2. 
the, the last part of verse 2 in our text. It says, although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, the Gibeonites, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. Saul, as, as in keeping with his character throughout the story of 1 Samuel, where he is always willing to pursue political advantage at the cost of disobedience to the Lord. In his zeal for Israel and Judah, in his zeal to expand his territory and his political influence, in nationalistic zeal, Saul had disregarded and made light of this covenant. And in doing so, he had made light of the name of the Lord. Saul indicated he had no regard for the holiness of God's name. And so we may ask, well, Saul broke the covenant, and then the Lord took him out in battle with the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. Problem solved, right? Wrong. You see, Saul was not merely acting by himself in breaking this covenant. He wasn't acting for himself. He was acting in an office. He held the office of king of Israel. And he was acting on behalf of the nation of Israel. And he was breaking the covenant on behalf of the people of Israel. There's a principle in the Bible called federal headship. Federal headship simply means covenantal headship. It means that, that there is a relationship in which we stand, uh, in which the actions of a covenant head count and apply to us. There is a, there's a corporate implication of us in the deeds of a covenant head. And that's how it worked for Israel with their own kings. That's how it worked here. When Saul broke the covenant, he broke it for himself and the whole nation that was under his federal headship. And so Israel now has broken the covenant. And the land has been polluted by the blood of Gibeonites to whom Israel had sworn would be protected. So according to Numbers 35, verse 33, the law of Moses said, you shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Guilt of Saul, the guilt uh, that, uh, that Saul perpetuated now hangs over David's kingdom. And that's why there's a famine. It's because God is defending the holiness of his own name that Saul had disregarded. Federal headship applies to us as well. We are not citizens of the nation of Israel, but according to 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul writes, in Adam all die. What does that mean to be in Adam? It means that we are under his federal headship. It means that his action in the Garden of Eden of sinning against the Lord is now imputed to us. The guilt of Adam is something we all share in as our federal head. And we inherit that guilt and corruption from Adam so that we are born into this world, all born by ordinary generation, as the Catechism says. All are born with the guilt of Adam's sin, alienated from God, and with a propensity towards sin. And this sin tells a lie about who God is. All sin is a lie about God. All sin is a way of declaring that He is not God. He is not sovereign Lord and Creator. He is not supreme. When we sin... We assume that prerogative for ourselves. We tell God, I will be Lord of myself. Thank you very much. And every time sin is committed, the lie multiplies. And it hangs out there awaiting its answer from divine wrath. Because God will defend his name. He is holy. He is always true 
to himself. And when you see the famine that he inflicted on David's kingdom, remember it is because he is defending the holiness of his own name. And that's what makes atonement necessary. God is holy and therefore he cannot simply pass over sin as though it's no big deal. His own name is implicated in how he responds to sin. And because it is such a weighty matter, that brings us to our second truth about atonement. Atonement is appalling. Atonement is appalling because sin is weighty. The average Israelite under the Mosaic Covenant would have grown up associating atonement with blood. He would have seen the animals brought to the priests. He would have seen a priest slit the throat of a lamb and drain its blood out. He would have seen a priest cut up the flesh of that animal and burn it on the altar. He would have seen the bloody hands and the blood-stained garments. And he would have known all of this blood and death is what is required for God to continue to dwell with us. He would have known from birth that atonement is not pretty. Nor is it pretty in this story either. What we see unfold here is in some ways even shocking. David, having approached the Gibeonites to ask what they would demand so that they may bless the people of Israel, they may relinquish their claim against Israel for the broken covenant, the Gibeonites respond by saying, give us seven of Saul's sons. Seven of Saul's sons and let us hang them before the Lord. Some commentators have said this is unjust. This is not the will of the Lord. This is not honoring to God for the Gibeonites either to ask for that or for David to grant it. And so they they look for ways in the text to try to undermine what the text so clearly seems to be telling us. I cannot read the text honestly and agree with those commentators. When I look at the text, I look at verse 1. Notice what the Lord said to David, presumably through a prophet at the end of verse 1. There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house. And then if you look at what the Gibeonite said in verse 4, the Gibeonite said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. And so the guilt for Saul's action is not merely limited to Saul. In some sense, it's applied to the whole nation, but there's a sense in which Saul's own house is now able to answer for it. Now, does that mean that we can apply guilt intergenerationally as a normal practice? Uh, Many of our descendants came from Europe, and uh, we know that in many cases, Europeans mistreated Native Americans. In many cases, Europeans owned slaves from Africa. And the so-called woke movement of today is built on the premise that if you're of European descent, if you're white today in American society, you are automatically guilty for the sins of your ancestors. And there's nothing you can do about it. Is that what this text is telling us? No. This is not a woke text. Uh, This text is about a very specific situation. Involving a covenant head, King Saul, who was in an office as king of Israel before the Lord and broke a very specific covenant. Uh, So don't read more into this text than it's telling us. Yes, there is intergenerational guilt applied here, but that doesn't mean that that is the normal practice. And other teachings of Scripture must inform the way we interpret that issue. If we allow ourselves to be taken in by that woke philosophy, We are just setting ourselves up to be manipulated by whatever the media and the left-wing institutions want to tell us to do. So that's not what this text is about. What it shows, rather, 
is that the house of Saul, in keeping with what God had said prior to this in 1 Samuel, the house of Saul has been rejected by the Lord. And the house of David has been affirmed in sonship to the Lord. And in keeping with that theme, David takes the action of essentially separating Israel from the house of Saul, taking the side of the Gibeonites against King Saul and his house and handing over these seven sons, two sons of Saul's concubine Rizpah, five sons of his daughter Merab, uh, as representatives of Saul's house so that they could be put to death to make atonement for this broken covenant. And they were not merely executed by the Gibeonites. The text tells us both in verse 6 and verse 9 that they were hanged before the Lord. That phrase, before the Lord, appears in both verses. And that's a way of showing us that this was not merely an act of criminal justice. This was a religious act. This was an act honoring the name of the Lord that had been invoked in the covenant that had been broken. Now, we could find that appalling, and to some degree, I think it, it's meant to be appalling to us. But what I find most appalling in this text is what we see in verse 10, where the mother of two of these men, after they are hung and their bodies are left hanging, went and set up a tent so that she could keep vigil over the bodies of her son to keep the birds of the air and the beasts of the field from devouring. Now, as you know, a woman could keep the birds and the beasts away, but she can't keep everything away. She can't keep the bacteria away. And so day after day, this mother who's lost her own sons, is now watching their bodies decompose before her eyes. I think that is meant to shock us. It is meant to tell us that atonement is ugly because death is ugly and the wages of sin is death. In 2013, USA Today published a story about the hymn that we just sang, In Christ Alone. And the story was about how this hymn had been considered for inclusion with a new hymnal coming out with the Presbyterian Church USA, which is the more liberal denomination of Presbyterians. Now, ultimately, the committee decided not to include In Christ Alone in this forthcoming hymnal. And the reason is because of the line in the second verse that we sang. And I love to hear you sing it. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That was a bridge too far for the committee of the Presbyterian Church USA. And so they did not include it and they they, uh, did not Uh, have any way of including it since the authors would not allow alteration to the lyrics. Chris Joyner, uh, pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Franklin, Tennessee, was quoted in that article in 2013 as saying, saying about that line in the hymn, that lyric comes close to saying that God killed Jesus. The cross is not an instrument of divine wrath. Now, sadly, Reverend Joyner's words are not terribly uncommon among those who name the name of Christ. There are many who find the notion that Jesus bore the wrath of God in our place as offensive and appalling. And I think what they're actually rejecting is the notion of divine wrath itself. They have remade God in their own image. They want a God who's palatable, a God who doesn't offend modern sensibilities, 
but they don't allow the Bible to tell them who God is and what He demands and how He has made atonement. You see, the biblical teaching of God's wrath fits hand in hand with the teaching of His holiness. Sin is an offense against the infinite dignity of God. Sin is making light of His holy name, and therefore sin is a matter of infinite weight. And for that reason, atonement must be ugly. It cannot be anything else. Golgotha, the place of the skull where Jesus was crucified, is not a pretty place. It is hell on earth. And I mean that literally. Our sin demands nothing less. Those who are appalled at the idea that God killed Jesus should listen more closely to Scripture. Isaiah 53 verse 10 tells us it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Romans 3.25, God put forward Christ as a propitiation in order to demonstrate his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The cross is not pretty. It's not a piece of jewelry. It's not a decoration. It's an instrument of bloody torture and death. And yet we look to the cross. We boast in the cross. We glory in the cross. Because it is truly an act of God. And that brings us to a third truth about atonement. Atonement is effective because God is gracious. The ugliness, the appalling nature of atonement is, is not an end in itself. It's for a greater purpose. It removes the wrath of God from His people. Notice in verse 10, it tells us, Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock, from the beginning of harvest until rain fell upon them from the heavens. Now, some commentators argue there that that, that is a time reference from the beginning of the harvest around April to the early rains in the fall, probably October. So some have argued that, that Rizpah could have spent six months keeping vigil over the bodies of her sons. I don't actually read the text that way. Uh, I, I don't know that the bodies actually would have lasted that long to begin with. But second, the verb there that indicates that rain fell from heaven is a verb in Hebrew that normally indicates a downpour. And I think that what this is showing us is that this was an extraordinary rain. This was not just the normal rains they were expecting at the time. This was an extraordinary downpour from heaven to show the famine is ended. God's wrath has now been satisfied. The curse has been lifted. And God is now showing favor to the land again. We also see at the end of the text, at the end of verse 14, after the whole episode, it says, after that, God responded to the plea for the land. The same phrase will be used at the end of 2 Samuel 24, uh, if you want to look at that story later. Uh, but it shows that God's curse his covenant curse, his wrath, has been removed. The guilt of Saul's house that hung over David's kingdom is now gone because of David's atoning act in handing over these seven sons to the Gibeonites. I also think this text shows us the effectiveness of atonement in another way. In verses 11 to 14, we read about how David responded when he heard about Rizpah's uh, act of keeping vigil over the bodies of her sons. It tells us that he went to uh, Jabesh, where the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan had been buried. Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle against the Philistines. The Philistines had taken their bodies and sought to dishonor them by hanging them on a wall in their city of Bethshan. But the men of Jabesh Gilead had gone and stolen those bodies and buried them in their own city. And now David, years later, 
goes to Jabesh to retrieve the bones of Saul and Jonathan, and he brings them to the territory of Saul's ancestor, Benjamin. And he has the bodies of these seven sons who have also been hanged, brought together, and he buries them in a family tomb of Saul's father, Kish, in the territory of Benjamin. Now, why is that detail of the story told? How does that advance the narrative in any way? I think it shows us very clearly David is not motivated in this incident at all by personal vengeance. Of all people David could get back at, it would be Saul and his house. Saul had, in a fit of jealousy, tried to kill David on multiple occasions, had pursued him here and there for a long time, had made David's life miserable. David had married Saul's daughter. When when David was on the run from Saul, Saul gave her away to another man. Saul had treated David absolutely horribly. And this was David's opportunity to say, now that I've got his sons hanging, I can let their bodies stay there perpetually. And I can dishonor them and I can show that David has now triumphed over the house of Saul. I can vindicate the honor of my own name. But that's not how David responds. Not at all. Just as he had done during Saul's lifetime, he continues to show honor to the house of Saul by giving them an honorable burial in the tomb of Saul's father. David does not exact personal vengeance because he sees that what really matters in this account is that God's name be vindicated. That God's claims have been met. And once that is done, David has no more claim to exact. Our theology of atonement is what enables us to release to the Lord the anger, the bitterness, the resentment we feel toward others. Think about it. When you're angry, when you're bitter, when you're resentful against another person, What you're feeling in your own heart is a response to a perceived injustice, right? That's what anger is. You're you're responding to what you perceive to be an injustice. Biblically speaking, whose responsibility is it to bring justice? Is it yours? If you say, it is my role to exact vengeance, it's my role to hold this grudge, it's my role to nurture this bitterness so that that person can get what he deserves or what she deserves. If you say that, you are assuming the prerogative of God. And you are saying that either the cross of Christ is not sufficient for that person or when the day of judgment comes, God won't exact justice. But either way, you're telling God, let me do your job for you. Now, we can point to the absurdity of of what I mentioned earlier, the woke movement that really, I believe, is a form of anti-gospel today. It's, It's a movement that's predicated on bitterness and resentment. It divides this group against that group, and it it constantly nurtures these feelings of resentment so that there can be nothing but piling on and piling on and piling on of offenses. And there's no mechanism of atonement. There's nothing you can ever do in the woke movement to uh, be forgiven. This anti-gospel that we can very easily spot for what it is, and yet, if we harbor bitterness and resentment in our own hearts, aren't we doing the same thing? Aren't we acting in an anti-gospel way? Now, there is one more detail of this story that I did not point out yet, and that's in Verse 7, it tells us, But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So when David is choosing the seven descendants of Saul for this execution, he very deliberately did not choose Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan. There was another Mephibosheth, Apparently, that's a very popular name back then. Mephibosheth for boys and 
Amber for girls, I don't know, but David spared the Mephibosheth who was the son of his dear friend Jonathan. Why did he do that? Because he had made a covenant with Jonathan. He had promised Jonathan by covenant to show favor, to show loyalty and kindness to Jonathan's offspring. And he had brought Mephibosheth, this crippled man, into his own home to sit at his own table. And he would not violate the covenant. Mephibosheth, you might say, was protected from death by the covenant that David had made. And in a similar way, we who belong to the new covenant, we who have moved from the covenant headship of Adam to the federal headship of Christ, we are protected from death by the protection that is given us in the promises our covenant head has made to us. Like Mephibosheth, we are protected from the wrath of God if we are hidden in Christ. In the words of John Newton, let us wonder grace and justice, join and point to mercy's store, when through grace in Christ our trust is, justice smiles and asks no more. In the new covenant, justice has been done. And we who are in Christ have no wrath left to face. The atonement is effective because God is gracious. In 1521, the reformer Martin Luther wrote a letter to his friend and colleague, Philip Melanchthon. And he said very famously, sin boldly. Now, if you hear that out of context, that sounds terrible. Sounds like he's telling Melanchthon, now go out and sin all you want. That is not what Luther was saying. Let me read to you in a fuller context what Luther was saying to his friend Philip. If you are a preacher of grace, then preach a true and not a fictitious grace. If grace is true, you must bear a true and not a fictitious sin. God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. Be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. For he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. Do you think that the purchase price that was paid for the redemption of our sins by so great a lamb is too small? Pray boldly. You too are a mighty sinner. You see what Luther's saying here? He's not saying, go out and sin all you want. What he's saying is, be open and honest about the gravity of your sin. Let the full weight of your sin hit you. And believe in Christ even more boldly. Because Christ didn't die for the imaginary sins you wish you would have committed. He died for the real sins you did commit. And he is a real savior of real sinners. So may we sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. We're going to come to the table. And as we do, it will be one more occasion for us, week by week, to declare our faith in Christ again. To declare that though we are great sinners, He is an even greater Savior. So I want to invite you to the table. If you are a baptized believer in good standing with a church. Uh, and so if, if that's not you today, if you're not a believer in Christ, then we want to ask you just to abstain. If you'd like to, to stay at your seat or you can even walk by when we serve, but just refrain from taking the bread and the cup. Uh, but we ask you not to partake with us today because we want you first to come to faith in Christ to believe in Him for the forgiveness of your sins and salvation so that you may then declare that publicly through baptism. And so if you would like to, to uh, speak to any of us today, any of the pastors about taking that step toward baptism, we would love to talk to you today or, or talk to one of your neighbors. Any one of us would love to tell you more about publicly joining yourself to Christ through baptism and through membership in a church. But if you are a believer, we invite you to come 
And what we'll do in just a moment is come forward row by row and just grab one stack, and, and it's got two cups in it, the bread and the juice. And so take that one stack and return to your seat, and then we will all eat and drink together. So would you take a moment of silence and bow your heads as we prepare to serve the bread and the cup? <laughs> 